Hello, my name is Takafumi Arakaki. I'm postdoc in MIT Julia Lab. Today, I'd like to present how we are trying to teach parallelism to the Julia compiler. So we are at JuliaCon, so obviously we really like using Julia, right? But why it's so good? Well, I like it because it let me use high level of abstraction and it also produces excellent performance. My favorite example is broadcasting. If you poke into the implementation of broadcasting, you'll find out very well structured but complex pipeline for supporting this notation. Yet the compiler can optimize it very well and in many cases, the overhead is negligible. So how does Julia pull it off? There's of course the hard work of Julia's and LLVM's compiler developers, which has been going on for a long time and even before I know Julia. But here I want to focus on the clever language design. By that I say, the, uh, Julia the language is express, expressive enough for high level of abstraction, but yet restrictive enough for optimizations. By restrictions, I mean something like, for example, uh, there's no runtime eval. Okay, there's a way to do it, but my point is that there's uh, this cannot be triggered by default, and there's also a strong culture in the ecosystem that doing this is frowned upon. The point is that runtime eval is not is not the norm, and so a large part of the code in the Julia ecosystem can be statically analyzed. Also, there's no uh, inheritance, so to speak, of a struct. It's unlike many class-based object-oriented programming languages. This helps caching methods because you don't have to invalidate the compiled method when a child class or child, uh, child struct is added. I also find it interesting that Julia chose uh, what I call pure iteration protocol. It is in contrast to many imperative programming languages which tend to have um, iterator protocol that relies on side effects, so iterator object. But I think Julia's choice actually makes sense if you consider the dynamics of Julia and also the high performance requirement of its for loop. So I think that's how, or like part of how Julia optimizes, uh, Julia language helps Julia compilers optimizing serial programs. But what about parallel programs? So as you know, Julia already has a nice interface for it, using multiple CPUs at once. But if you're not careful, uh, you can get something like this bad orange line, meaning that uh, using the parallelism API um, first slows down your program. And so you have to add lots and lots of worker, worker threads to uh, speed it up or just to be even be comparable to the original serial, serial program in worst case, worst case scenario. But the ideal situation would be that using a parallelism API does not add any overhead. So we can then expect that adding worker threads would actually increase the performance uh, uh, compared to the serial uh, sing single threaded program. Uh, so in other words, if we want a good speed up, we need to have a, this good, uh, good, uh, good starting point. And that's, uh, that's the today's topic. So, I'm not going to talk about about this uh, the scaling of this, this lineality, uh, ideally linear linear relationship of this kind of graph, because this is uh, the the property of the scheduler, and it's not for it's not the property of the, of the compiler. Okay, so let's step back a little bit and then look at how the Julia compiler works at at high level. As you know, uh, it has multiple stages. So the source code is parsed into AST and AST is uh, processed by macros and lowering steps and AST is transformed into Julia's uh, intermediate, intermediate representations and, uh, and the type of inference and some optimization happens there. And Julia IR is transformed to in, into the LLVM IR and some optim LLVM optimizations are run on LLVM IR. And then there's also some Julia specific lowerings. And then finally, uh, LLVM IR is compiled down to the, to the assembly. So how does the current parallelism API fit in this view? 
first, we have the source code. It contains the AdSpawn macro that you can import from the base threads module. Uh, it, it is parsed, and then macros are expanded into this code uh, on the right-hand side, roughly speaking. Uh, note that at this point, the code inside of Spawn uh, is outlined into a function. This outlined function is then passed into a, a, a runtime API to construct a Julia task. Note that at this stage, I mean, just after the uh, macro is expanded, but before all these compiler optimizations, we have these runtime functions. The problem is that these runtime functions cannot be analyzed by the compiler. It means that the user code defining uh, child task and, out, uh, and uh, parent task uh, cannot be optimized together. So this is not a Julia specific problem. There's in fact the same problem in Silk, which is a, which is a parallel extension of C and C++. To solve this, Shardell, Moses, and Laserson invented something called Taper, which is an extension to uh, SSA IRL for parallel tasks, or uh, more specifically, focus on parallelism. The idea at high level is pretty simple. If the runtime function gets into the way of optimizations, let's introduce them later. This works nicely for them in C and C++, so we want to try this in Julia too. Uh, so our strategy at the moment is to introduce runtime function just before LLVM IR. But since the original work was done in LLVM, an ambitious next step will be to push this further and uh, do the to the introduce the runtime in, inside of LLVM too. Uh, but before doing this, uh, we need to make sure that it, it works well with Julia IR and Julia compiler. Uh, the, good new, the good news is that we have already observed that unlocking the Julia compiler, uh, the optimization inside the Julia compiler can already have like large impact in some, uh, some parallel programs. So um, this is the Taper API in Julia. There's this uh, taper at spawn macro, like uh, thread at spawn macro that you uh, you can use today. Uh, and this uh, at spawn macro acts, acts like a let block, but obviously it can make your code parallel. And then there's uh, this taper at sync macro. This declares a region of the code in which you can use uh, taper at spawn macro. It is called the sync region. The result of this, uh, uh, the result of uh, taper task spawned inside of this sync re region can be used at after the end of this sync region. Uh, the, the, the the taper sync macro also acts like a uh, let block uh, with respect to with respect to the scoping rule. And finally, there's a taper at output macro, which can be used to, to denote the output variables that are set inside of the at sync macro and used outside. And in terms of in terms of a scop scoping rule, it acts like the local variable declaration. So I've been saying acts like, but it actually has a proper meaning, which is called the serial projection property. It means that the programmer have to make sure that the program written using taper, something like on the left hand side, uh, can be executed as some uh, as something uh, the program like the one on the right hand side. So the taper output will uh, ha can be uh, converted into local variable declaration, and the sync and the spawn are converted in in let block. This is called uh, and this, this program is called uh, the serial projection of the original program. In other words, the parallelism of taper is optional, meaning that the child task may or may not be executed in parallel with respect to the, the parent task. The implication of this is that the program written using taper, using taper API can be analyzed as if it were a serial program, very roughly speaking. Um, we obviously have to massage uh, the compiler a little bit, but for now, let's see what kind of uh, optimizations we can uh, we can get out 
we can get out of this. Okay, so here's a list of macro benchmarks with and without TAPO. Um, they are compared to uh, they're, they're compared with respect to equivalent serial program. I'm only showing the result of a single thread performance. This is because the purpose of TAPO is to get a good starting point of the scaling. I hope you remember this graph. Uh, so the y-axis of the left and the right graphs are, are the same, but I'm calling uh, the one on the left uh, work efficiency because uh, the maximum speed up you can get with a single thread is one, so it's kind of uh, confusing to call it uh, speed up. Uh, but the point is that you can judge how good the compiler is, the, the compiler is by checking how close these points are uh, to, to this y equal, uh, y equal one line. Okay, uh, so the first benchmark is demonstrating that inference uh, uh, demonstrating that inference failure can be catastrophic in Julia. It's not new, so uh, it's kind of a sanity check, but uh, but you can see that uh, with taper, uh, the, there's almost no uh, slowdown compared to the serial program, but without taper, there's like a drastic drop in performance, which you would want to avoid. Um, and similarly, since constant propagation happens during type inference, we have a similar effect when using taper. The third example is a bit more non-trivial, and it shows that the dead code elimination can be triggered using my uh, using my implementation of taper. And the last example shows that it can trigger uh, an optimization called a scalar replacement scalar replacement of aggregate, meaning that the compiler can decompose mutable objects into the mutable struct into the scalar variables holding the values of each field. Um, but um, I should emphasize that these benchmarks are really, really micro benchmarks or more like nano benchmarks. And uh, these, number pro is a, uh, these numbers are rather meaningless if you don't look at the code. So let's look at just one of them. So for example, this is what the uh, what the uh, dead call dead code elimination example uh, is doing. As you can see, uh, after the end of the sync, we use the variables b1 and b2, but not a1 and a2, even though they were set inside of the task. It in turn means that we don't have to calculate uh, the the value of a inside of the loop. So that's and this dead code can be eliminated by, by the compiler. So, okay, this is nice for demo, but maybe you're wondering if it can be can be relevant in, in, in a bit more practical code. So that's, uh, here's an example. It's obviously a bit long, but so let me explain. So first of all, it is using a parallel loop syntax for my, my package called floops, uh, which has some uh, taper-based, sorry, Taper-based execution backends now, now. but for now uh, let's treat it as a parallel loop syntax. Um, we can uh, we can compute reduction uh, like this. It is computing some minimum and the maximum. Uh, the the zero inf and minus inf there are actually not typo. They are just specifying the identity element of the corresponding binary operators. Um, after they are computed in the first parallel loop, the second uh, parallel loop uh, does some kind of element-wise normalization using this normalizer uh, function passed as an argument. So for example, uh, you can use it to normalize the values between zero and one, or uh, this demi function um, for can be used to uh, subtracting uh, the mean, or maybe doing them at once. I'm not sure um, this exact exactly this computation. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if someone needs this exact exactly this computation, um, although probably uh, I, I think it's entirely possible. But my point here is that Julia can be used to cook up this kind of ad hoc abstraction while you explore, exploring your domain specific problems. So anyway. Um, Interesting thing happens, for example, if you run this demo with uh, the, this uh, demi function, since it doesn't have to compute the lower and upper bound, so the Julia and Eleven compiler uh, can just uh, emit the code that only computes uh, 
com compute the sum inside of the first parallel loop. Okay. So optimizations are nice, but you might be wondering uh, what's the price. Uh, so the constraint of taper tasks is the shear projection property. In particular, it implies that you can't use um, some task synchronization mechanisms like a channel. For example, consider the pro program on the on on the left. Uh, if you if you if you are using normal Jira task API, it's perfectly fine, but it's not the correct taper program. You can easily see this by looking at the serial projection, since uh, the first take. Uh, so since this first take uh, happens before put, and the ch channel is empty, the program deadlocks in the serial projection. So this is not a valid, valid uh, taper uh, program. And it means that if you want to write a program that deals with concurrency, you still need to use a normal Julia task. But on the other hand, uh, many programs do not need uh, that, this kind of synchronization. For example, um, for, for example, uh, structured uh, structured parallel for loops or equivalently parallel reduction does not require this. It implies that many number crunching code like matrix multiplication can be done in taper. Another set of example is um, parallel sorting algorithm, al algorithms. And in general, algorithms like uh, using divide and conquer approach are pretty good fit uh, of for using taper. Uh, okay, so my primary focus here is the compiler, but the semantics of the taper task have have implications outside uh, the compiler too. For example, here is a benchmark of uh, of the Fibonacci number. Comp uh, yeah. Uh, Here's a benchmark of the Fibonacci number computed using uh, computed in parallel, uh, which is, by the way, the worst approach. Since, uh, as you can see, it's way slower than doing this in par uh, in serial. So uh, this uh, horizontal dotted line. Um, it's just for benchmarking and scheduler, and this is why um, you can see that. Uh, implementation with taper and without taper uh, have identical performance. The compiler does not help here, but combining a simple work, ske work stealing scheduler to taper improves the performance compared to, compared to the, uh, the original uh, implementation. I'm mentioning this here because uh, taper, since uh, because uh, the the taper tape, tape API now includes a way to define scheduler without touching the Julia runtime itself, it's um, it's rather an, an experimental API even within the taper API, which itself is experimental. Uh, but anyway, this is a fun way to play with uh, task scheduling, and uh, to use this feature, you just have to implement something called task group in Pure Julia and then pass it to uh, uh, this taper at sync macro we, we were discussing. I find it, um, so I find it customizing uh, schedule, I find it supporting customizable schedule interesting because it cleanly decompose what and how. Um, the compute oriented packages declare the can declare the parallelized portion of their code without worrying about scheduling using taper. Well, actually, they're more like this allowed to interfere with the scheduling because of the serial projection property. This is nice for users since each of each one of them can have unique requirement for scheduler. For example, maybe you'd want to isolate latency sensitive tasks uh, to uh, to throughput oriented tasks, or maybe you want to get the result as soon as possible and don't care too much about if the result is slightly non deterministic 
or maybe you want to debug the behavior of non-determinate non scheduler by replacing uh, the scheduling decision by 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 uh, by uh, like uh, replaying the scheduling decision. Also, all these aspects interact with how you'd want to use a task local random number generator. So there's it, now it all it again like increases customi customizable point. I think taper tasks are particularly interesting here for this purpose, since the requirement for the scheduler is lighter than the fully concurrent Julia tasks, uh, because it can be synchronized in arbitrary ways. So it's easy. So it's easier to implement customized scheduler for taper. Uh, there's also interesting development uh, for supporting process-based parallelism by Diogo Neto. Um, he implemented a proof of concept in uh, uh, proof of concept by connecting taper and then distributed JL, um, and he and he did it in his uh, uh, student research program, um, and it can be interesting to use this uh, with uh, uh, it can be um, so I think. Uh, this can be integrated using uh, this customized or scheduler API, which would be interesting. Okay, and then TAPA is also not just for performance. For example, it can be used for detecting races. This is a screenshot in a VS Code session. Uh, the compiler detects that the child task is updating, I think the variable A, which is also updated in the parent task. Uh, so this uh, plus one, plus one and uh, plus two happening in different tasks. So it inserted an error there. And when I run the function, VS Code highlighted the error line. Currently, the compiler is only detecting the error that can be done for free. Um, but there's, there are also known algorithms de to detect races uh, more eagerly at runtime. Diogo Neto, again, also wrote a proof of concept that works with, with the tape at output macro. At the moment, we are um, we're trying to extend this to extend this to other cases. Okay, so far I've been mostly talking about kind of re-observation of the original studies of Taper and Silk, but there are some interesting interactions between Julia and Taper. In the Julia compiler, variables are the primary "Quote unquote mutable states uh, that are that and that are infallible as of today. Um, this almost necessitates, I think, a syntax like tepa dot uh, 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 at, at, tepa at output macro to mark the task out of it. A happy accident of this was that it gives us compile time race detection kind of for free. By for free, I mean that the detection is." is a part of the processing that has to happen anyway. Another Julia specific twist was that Julia uses a uh, high order function as very common abstraction. In particular, we use the do block syntax for, for example, resource management like opening files. Um, and we are doing this all the time. So, but introducing function boundaries between sync and spawn are not allowed in the original uh, Taper LAVM. But while we're discussing this, it looks like there's a way to do it correctly. And then another happy accident was that when I implemented this in Julia, it makes supporting multiple scheduler very, uh, very straightforward. In fact, I did it in one go. Okay, to summarize today, I try to explain why current Julia parallelism is hard to optimize. Taper is a solution and lets you declare a portion of a code that can, can be run in parallel, but the parallelism is optional. This is actually expressive enough for many programs, but it is restrictive enough for optimizations. Taper is also not for compiler, not just for compiler. Uh, it would be interesting to add more schedulers to, uh, for, for common needs of applications. Uh, Taper also includes uh, the productivity by detecting some races by default. Uh, 
Finally, I'd like to thank my funding programs, exascale simulation of materials in extreme environment, and performance automation of parallel program assembly. I also would like to thank my collaborators, Valentin Shabari and TB, uh, uh, TB Shadow. Uh, people in Juliacon obviously know uh, Valentin, but let me note that he wrote the original proof of concept patch for adding Taper to Julia, and my branch is based on, based on his work. TB is the researcher behind the current open silk technology, and the original work on ta uh, Taper LA Beam was done by him and his co-workers. And before finishing my presentation, I'd like to uh, thank your attention.